Good evening, and welcome to our Bible study. I'm Pastor A.D., Pastor of True Vine, NBC here in Houston, Texas, and I thank you so much for joining us once again. And we are still in, in Corinthians, we're in 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll start at verse 1. I'm going to pray, and we're going to get right into it. And thank you so much for all your support once again. Um, I love you so much. Thank you. Lord, we bless your holy name, Lord. We glorify you, Lord. We thank you, dear God, for another day, another chance, another opportunity, dear God, to come to you, Lord, and to learn your word, to hear your word, dear God, to study your word. We thank you so much for the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that you have given us. We bless your holy name, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the life of Paul. We thank you, Lord, dear God, for sending your own begotten son to die, to rise on the third day for our sins, Lord, and to give us eternal life. Lord, we thank you, dear God. Continue to increase us in knowledge and wisdom and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm going to read the overview of this chapter like I do all the time. So you'll have a better understanding of what's going on within this chapter before we start. And the topic is facing life obstacles while keeping your integrity. Facing life obstacles while keeping your integrity. So let's open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and one of the most practical, one of the most encouraging, and one of the most helpful sections in all of the, this great epistle. Now remember, as Paul writes this letter to the beleaguered Christians of Corinth, he himself is beleaguered as well. The apostle is facing death on a daily basis as he has continued his ministry from its beginning Hostility has escalated. Hostility, animosity, persecution has grown and grown to a fever pitch, both among us, among Jews who plotted to take his life and Gentiles who saw him as a threat, not only to, to their religion, but to their political stability. And so Paul is continually being persecuted. In fact, we find him as he writes this letter under a daily sentence of death. He realizes that at any moment, any day, he could lose his life. The hostility swirls around him. The hatred has escalated. The animosity has accumulated great power and strength. And the sense of imminent death comes through in this letter many times. Back in chapter 1, for example, he writes in verse 4 about all of our affliction and how much we need God of all comfort in the midst of that affliction. The familiar text of chapter 11 in verse uh, 23, he says, In four more labors and four more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. And then he talks about the five times he received 39 lashes, my God. The three times he was beaten with rods and he was stoned, three times shipwrecked and spending a night and a day in the sea. And on and on about dangers, the labors, the hardships, sleepless nights, hunger, thirst, without food, cold exposure. In verse 12, in chapter 12, it says uh, he was caught up in the third heaven. He was caught up in third heaven. So that's chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians verse 1. He was caught up in third heaven. And even in that, he says in verse 10 of chapter 12, I am well content with weaknesses, insults, distresses, persecutions, and difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, I'm strong. Now back to chapter five, all of that to say he lived on the brink of death. He knew that every morning when he first opened his eyes, it could be his last day. And the question that arises is how did he do? How did he deal with this? How did he face this? How could he feel how could he deal with death every day? He was like a soldier on the front line of a fierce battle with bullets flying all around him every single day. How did he face the possibility every day? Like a loyal soldier in the fire of war, the possibility of death. What was the perspective? Was, uh, what was his attitude? And he knew he could be killed at any time. With that understanding, did he view his earthly demise? Didn't he have any fear of the pain that might be associated with dying? The pain of some torture, um, some knife, some spear, some sword, some axe. Didn't he have some, some dread of death? The um, in inevitability of leaving this world and facing the next. But as you look at his life, the more hostility escalated, the more the persecution escalated, the more bold he became. And 
even when he was dragged in before all the dignitaries and all the authorities who held his life in their control, he never, ever toned the message down. He just cranked it up. He never lost his boldness. He never lost his conviction. He never lost the courage to proclaim the truth that was the very reason his life was threatened. He faced death courageously. I'll go beyond that. He faced death gladly. He faced death um, happily. In fact, he preferred it to life. And when you get to that point, that'll take all the sting out of persecution. That'll take all the fear out of rejection, all the dread out of physical difficulties and illness and dangers. He was the man who said, for to me to live is, is Christ and to die is gain. He was the man who said, far better to depart and be with Christ. He faced death as a preferable um, alternative. That's the way he faced it. And consequently, he had no fear. He welcomed it. And if he was discomforted, and if he was saddened, and if he was sorrowful, it had to do with the failures of his life. It had to do with the unrequited uh, love towards believers. It had to do with a broken heart over the lost. It, it didn't have to do with a fear of death. Amen. Amen. So that's the overview. Now let's start at verse 1 of chapter 5. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in heaven. Let's stop right there. So Paul's metaphor for the physical body, the imagery was quite natural for that time because people were nomadic tent dwellers. And Paul, as a tent maker, knew much about tent's characteristics. Paul, Paul's point is that like a temporary tent, man's earthly existence is fragile, insecure, and lowly. Paul's metaphor for the believer's resurrected and glorified body, a heavenly, eternal body. That's what he's talking about. Verse 2, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. So what he's saying is we're uncomfortable in this body. There's certain kind of misery in this body. We are unfulfilled. We are incomplete. We are imperfect. And we ache, we sigh, we yearn for the next life that this is mortal uh, may be swallowed up by which is immortal, incorruptible, and eternal. He's groaning with a passionate longing. He's uh, wearing of the frustration of this life. So he's getting weary of it. He's tired of this life, the disappointments, the limitations, the wickedness, the weakness, the sins. And he wants to be free from all of this debilitating, uh, debilitating, um, wearing, um, relentless um, living, this worrying, this trouble, this pain. He want to be free from it. The disabilities of, of earthly life plague him, and he had enough. He's had enough. And so he says, for indeed, because we know what awaits us in the house, we groan, longing to be clothed in our uh, dwelling from heaven. He mixes his metaphor a little bit there, doesn't he? He got, he's got the house uh, being put on as if it were clothing, but that's all right. We understand what he means. He's talking about his resurrection body, his resurrected body. Um, but more than that, he's talking about the perfections of immorality. This life that he refers to in verse 4, he groans with longing for the glorious manifestation of the sons of God. He groans to be made like Christ, to share his glory to and share his uh, perfection. And it would be his desire to have it immediately. He had his choice. He desired to be in glory. Third verse, if indeed have been clothed, we shall not be found naked. That's an interesting thing. What does he mean by this? Now follow this thought. It's very inter interesting. And there have been a lot of different interpretation of what he intends to say here. I think the simplest one will unfold to you as you Listen to what I say. He says, let me clarify what I mean. When we put on the resurrection body, we won't be naked. 
So being naked would be a condition in which you didn't have your resurrection body, right? I mean, that's very clear. Nakedness would be a condition when you didn't have your resurrection body because when you put it on your, on your, uh, you are not found what? Naked. When you put it on, you're not found naked. So uh, without it, you're naked. What he's talking about? He's talking about that this hope is a believer, a believer's uh, a believer is not some spiritual life to come, but a life to come that is spiritual, but also involves a resurrected body. That's very important to him. Very important. It's very important to the Corinthians and it's very important issue in the New Testament. Let me tell you why. In the Greek culture, there was a reigning philosophy of dualism and dualistic philosophy basically said matter is evil and spirit is good. Um, just like Romans 8.23, groaning for the redemption of our body. We groan. And, and what are we groaning about? Being burdened, weighed down by afflictions, weakness. Uh, we talked about it a little bit ago. Limitations, particularly by iniquities. Not because we want to be unclothed. We don't want to just float around as disembodied spirits, but to be clothed in order that what is mortal, that part of us, which is mortal, may be swallowed up by what is immortal, even eternal life. It's a wonderful thought. He's saying, I want the fullness of everything God has for me. I don't want to float in, this, in the spirit all over eternity. I want to enter into the full and perfect condition in my glorified humanity. I want to be literally swallowed up by the fullness of all eternal life can bring. So believers are not to be satisfied with the redemption of the soul. We long for the body. We long, we long, we long to be complete, bottom line. We long to be complete, which is the image of Jesus Christ. We will be made just like him. And that's why 1 John says, when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And he that has uh, this hope, in him purifies himself. We should have that hope, the hope of the resurrection body of the glorified body. We should have that hope. Okay, verse five, verse five, verse uh, five. I think I did four and five right there. If I'm read four because I just did four. For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be clothed, but rather, but further clothed that uh, morality may be swallowed up by life. Verse five says, now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. And so in verse four, that's when I talked about just like Romans 8, 23, groaning for the redemption of our body. We groan, we groan for it, we groan for it. And that's what was going on. He was groaning. They, our bodies groaned for it. We groaned to be complete, to be made perfected, to be, to be made perfect. Um, and one day we will be perfected. We will be glorified one day. Okay, our bodies will, we, we, we will be glorified. Remember, this fleshly thing cannot go, the go to heaven, but the inner man goes straight to heaven, absent from the body's present with the Lord. And, and one day when Jesus come back to uh, rapture his church, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then those who are alive shall be caught up. Now, again, we will be joined, not this fleshly body is, is going to stay here on earth, it's going to die out. However, the uh, inner man is going to come out the body for those who are alive, and then the new body is going to meet your, your soul in the air. You, we will be made just like Christ. So whatever Christ can do, Whatever he looks like, that's what we'll be able to do and look like. Fifth verse, uh, the fact that the Holy Spirit lives in the life of a believer is God's pledge that the purpose will be filled. Whatever the Lord begins, he finishes. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, I don't see how you can um, uh, e um, e equivocate, uh, how can you compare it? I am confident. That's what I try to use, compare it. I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect, will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And when God starts it, he brings it to its end. When he started with the predestination, he'll finish it with glorification. Okay, so he started with predestination. Now, our names was written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundations of this world, before the world was created. Our names were already written. We were already chosen. We were already elected. 
uh, and we will be finished when it, when we are glorified. We receive glorification. That's when we'll be caught up in heaven. We will receive glorification. When he started with a promise in eternity past, he'll bring it to pass in making you into the image of Jesus Christ. Nothing is going to interrupt it. Um, nothing is going to separate you from the love of Christ. That Romans 8, uh, chapter 8, goes on to say that nothing is going to be able to change it. Not life, not death, nor principalities, powers, no thing, no, not things to come, not things in the present. Nothing was separated. The purpose of God is fixed. And to guarantee it, he gives us the spirit as a pledge. Pledge is Arabon in Greek. Arabon in Greek means engagement ring. So we're engaged. It means down payment. It means first installment. So right now as the church, we are engaged. And one day when we all get to heaven, we'll be married to the groom. We are the, the bride. We'll be married to the bridegroom. We will be married to the groom. We will marry Jesus Christ. It means pledge. It means security. It means guarantee. So we have guarantee. We are, we are, we have uh, assurance, assurance that one day we will be in heaven. We'll be glorified, perfected, and we will be made just like him. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee. The fact that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have of God, the fact that the Spirit of God has taken up residence in you, and every believer has the Spirit of God within them, and leads and guides you, as Roman 8 says, that you, by the Holy Spirit, can call yourself a child of God. The fact, as Romans 5 and 5 says, that the Spirit of God is shed abroad in your heart along with the love of God. The fact that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that he abides in you, that every believer uh, possesses the Holy Spirit, that Romans 8 and 9 says, if you don't have him, you're not a Christian. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit, him is not a it, it's a him. If you don't have the Holy Spirit within you, you are not a believer in Christ, okay? Uh, verse 6, so we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord because we know that while we are home in this body, we are absent from the Lord for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather than to be absent from the body, to be at home with the Lord, present with the Lord. There's the final point. He wants to be with the Lord. Paul longed to be with the Lord. You say, well, doesn't he love the people here? Yeah, but he loves the Lord more. In reality, it's that simple. Who do you love the most? Always of good courage. He faces his funeral with complete confidence, cheerful. Literally, it means to be a uh, be of good cheer to be happy. His attitude, his attitude is not the result of an emotional high. As I said, it's a settled confidence. And frankly, as I pointed out at the beginning, to despair about death is unchristian. Life is just a race to the finish. It's just a battle to win. It's just a stewardship to honor. And when the face, the race, I'm sorry, when the race is done and the battle is over and the stewardship is discharged, then the victory, then the triumph. There's no reason. There's no reason to clutch this life, to try to hold on as long as possible. There's no reason. Every believer should be willing and ready to die. The only reason to stay here is service. And when service is done, we should be eager as Paul to leave. There's no reason to sorrow when beloved, when Christ, when beloved Christian leaves to have some uh, morbid feeling of loss, but we do because we're human. Oh, there's a nature, a natural feeling of loss, of course, but it should never descend to anything morbid because when a believer goes into the presence of the Lord, that's the fulfillment of everything. That should be rejoicing. Whenever we lose someone, it should be a rejoicing, should be a rejoicing. And that's why we have home goings, have services to rejoice and to mourn too, but to really rejoice. And verse seven says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. This explains how we can live and serve an invisible God, how we could hope for an, an invisible place, a place we can't even see. We do it by faith. It's not a vague superstition. We believe and we live by that belief. It's not a belief in nothing. It's a belief in the word of God that tells us all of this. We believe in the word of God that tells us about heaven. We believe in the word of God that tells us about a resurrection and a resurrected body. So we live by faith in the word of God. And so Paul says, we face death 
with resolute, constant confidence, even in the most severe suffering and affliction, because we walk by faith, faith in the word of God. We haven't seen it except with the eye of faith. Blessed are those who haven't seen, but still yet believe. And that's what Jesus, that's what he said. So we are blessed to believe in an invisible God, something we can't see. We can't see, but we can feel him. And he's within us. The Holy Spirit is within us. And that is the third um, character of God, the third persons of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Verse 8 reads, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. And what he's saying, he's saying heaven's a better place. The word of God says so, and we believe it. And because it's a better place, we'd rather be there. And what makes it a better place is it is at home with the Lord. I love that phrase. We're of good courage. In fact, of death, we have hope, joy, confidence, because we prefer to be with the Lord. It's again, heavenly homesickness. Okay. How you be away from home, you get homesick. So we are homesick. I hope you understand what homesickness is. I hope you uh, had that kind of home where there's something really wonderful and special about going home and being with mom and dad. I hope you have that kind of home now where when you're away for a long period of time over a prolonged absence, there's something in your heart that is excited about coming home. I hope you have that toward heaven. I hope you long to be so much in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, our God, you have a heavenly sickness. Paul says, we prefer to be absent from the body. If you want to know what I want, I like to get out of this body and get there. We, where I belong, okay? He didn't want to be disembodied, uh, a disembodied spirit, but he was willing to be that for, for a period of time, if necessary, if he could be with the Lord as soon as possible. This is not a morbid death wish by any means. This is triumphant hope built on love. The love seeks its highest, purest form of fellowship with its object with this object verse 9 therefore we make it our aim whether present or absent to be well pleasing to him there is the noblest end the noblest end there is the highest goal to be pleasing to him erastos erastos um that's that means that same term is used in Titus 2 9 to speak of slaves whose passion was to satisfy their master as Rastos. Um, you see, this is a very important goal for anybody who is a Christian, particularly anybody who is a minister. It is not a sin, it's not a sin in his life unless it's selfish. Unless it's selfish. He should be marked by an ambition to please the Lord. We all should want to please the Lord. And that was true about Paul. He lived to please the Lord. He was like a violinist who really didn't care that much of the applause of the audience. He didn't care about the accolades, but he just wanted to please the Lord. He was like a uh, athlete who wasn't really moved by the roar of the crowd, but he was moved by the commendation of the coach. He's like a soldier who fought not for the thrill of victory, but for the affirmation of the general who put his hand on his shoulder and said, well done, soldier. The apostle Paul had an ambition and it had to do with pleasing the Lord. Nowhere is the focus of that ambition more clearly articulated than back in 1 Corinthians 4. If you'll turn back to 1 Corinthians 4, you'll see, you don't have to turn if you don't want to, you can see there how clear this focus was in Paul's mind how singular it was in 1 Corinthians 4. And you can see that. You can read that later. Uh, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that which one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. That shows the comprehensiveness and the inevitability of this event. We're all going to be there. We must all appear Fenero, Fenero, um, to be made manifest, to re be revealed, to be made clear. Well, who are we going to appear to? Some people say we're going to, uh, we're going to appear to all the angels. Uh, they're all going to be watching, 
and all the angels are going to be watching as our life is being made manifest. The Bible doesn't say that. That's pure speculation. If you choose to believe that, you can't support it. Somebody else says, well, all the all other Christians are going to be there watching. The Bible doesn't say that any place. You say, well, why is this manifestation going to take place if it's not for those angels and it's not for the rest of the believers? Well, it wouldn't be for the benefit of the rest of believers because they're going to have enough to do with just finding out about their stuff to be occupied without worrying about yours or mine. You say, well, it's going to be made manifest to God. No, he already knows it. He already knows every detail about our lives. The manifestation is to us. I'm going to find out on the real verdict on my life, the real verdict on my ministry, the real verdict on my service. This is not a judgment for sin. The sin was judged where? At the cross. We know that. So Romans 8 and 1, there's no condemnation unto those who are in Christ Jesus. And if sin became an issue at the judgment, then somehow the cross was incomplete. This is not a judgment on sin. And none of the texts that deal with the judgment seat of Christ or as Romans 14 calls the judgment seat of God, none of them deal with the sin as such. Sin has already been dealt with, but this is going to be the manifestation of our secret motive, secret attitude, so that we can see the reality of what we are. Okay, verse 11. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your conscience. So 11 verse, that unlocks the door to the purpose of this passage. We persuade man. Again, we is uh, editorial. Uh, we are editorial. The Paul, Paul uses we instead of I, though he's referring to himself because we are a more humble way to refer to himself. Uh, he does it all through the epistle. When he says persuade men, persuade men, that's what Paul would do, persuade. That's what, that's what Christianity is about, persuading. We should persuade men about Jesus Christ. He uses the verb pithio. Pithio is an interesting verb. It does mean to persuade, but it's translated in uh, Galatians 1.10 in a very helpful way under somewhat similar usage. In Galatians 1 and 10, Paul says, for I am now seeking the favor of men or of God, and their verb is pithio. Uh, it's translated seeking favor, seeking favor. And that is a good translation for it here. We are seeking your favor. What do you mean? We are seeking that you would look on us as a man of integrity. I want you to render a favorable judgment on me. It is important to me that you trust me, that you believe in my sincerity and my devotion to God and my honesty and my genuineness. Uh, now in Galatians, he would not seek the favor of men by compromising the gospel, but here he will seek their favor by speaking the truth about himself. Here it is not the gospel. That is an issue. That issue. This is the epistle is not um, evangelistic. He is not concerned to persuade men at Corinth about the gospel. He is concerned to persuade them about his integrity. That is the issue. He wants them to know that he is genuine. The following phrases make this very clear. Go back to verse 11. He says, we persuade men, but we are made known to God or made manifest to God. The point he's making here is simply this. God knows me. I am, mani I am manifest to him. He knows me. He knows my heart. He knows my integrity. That's the point. He knows my integrity. What I'm concerned about is that you know it as God knows it. We are revealed to God. Our true spiritual condition, God knows, and he knows per perfectly. It's very clear to him. Paul says, and I would like to, I would like to be clear to you. God, he says, knows me. God knows me. He says, God knows me. We're made manifest to God. God knows my sincerity. He knows my honesty. He knows my genuineness. He knows my integrity. And that's what he wants to make plain. Verse 12. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart and not in heart. This is a very, very important verse. And let me explain it to you. Paul knew that all the discrediting uh, false accusations against him would ultimately hurt the church. Right. Obviously. Why? 
Because if some people in the church begin to believe that Paul was a liar, a fake, a fraud, that would split the church because hmm, there would be the pro-Paul group and there would be the anti-Paul group. And he knew that. He knew that that would bring divisiveness within the church and there would be a war going on, on the, as false teachers gain more and more influence and they would be putting themselves and their converts against those who trusted Paul so that the unity of the church would be shattered. All, and I'll tell you something, folks, nothing will faster destroy the unity of the church than a group of people who begin to discredit its leadership, and that moves like a cancer and create discord. He also knew that once trust in him was lost, spiritual growth would be hindered because he was the source through which the revelation of God was coming to the church. He was. 13 New Testament epistles written by Paul. Where was the truth for their spiritual progress going to come from? Where was it going to come from other than Paul? He also knew that when the church became divided and spiritually stunted in its growth, immediately its impact in the community would be stopped and its opportunity to evangelize its culture significantly hindered. He was concerned about the church. I'm not trying to commend myself to my enemies. I'm not trying to all my friends to defend me. That is a wise, wise approach. I am giving you an occasion. I'm giving you an opportunity. What I'm saying is not for the enemies. It's for you. 13, for if we are beside ourselves, it is, God, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. Now we can understand from that verse that the debate was like in the Corinthian church. They, uh, there were the friends of Paul. They were the friends of Paul. Those who had been influenced by his life, those who had come to Christ under his preaching, those who had grown in their sanctification under his teaching, those who loved him and believed in him. And they viewed him as having a sound mind, a sound mind. But then there were the false teachers who came and stirred up everybody and they were able to win over converts. They started a full-scale rebellion led by the one who was influenced by Satan and who was orchestrating this whole rebellion. They had gotten people to join in in their criticism of Paul. He's beside himself. So you had the people who were Paul's friends saying he's of sound mind. You had the false teachers and those who chime in with them saying uh, he's really beside himself. Again, you see through here, he's using the editorial plural pronoun we but he refers his referring to himself let's take a look at this verse his ego is not a at stake his ego is not at stake and he's he makes that clear when he says if we are beside ourselves it is for god now what does he mean by this well beside ourselves that's extemi assist me assist me means to be out of his mind one's out of one's mind. He's out of his mind. He, he lost control of his uh, mind. It, it's used of insanity. Um, they were accusing him of being insane, mad. In fact, they were accusing him of being a fool, um, of a sound and sober mind. He refers to these accusations not only here, but over in chapter 11, verse 1, he co uh, com comments about the fact that they had thought him to be foolish. They thought him to be foolish, and that's sad. Paul loved this church so much, and he did so much for this church, but a lot of them in the church, within the church, hurt him, hurt his heart. Verse 14, for the love of Christ compels us because we judged us that if one died for all, then all died. So this is a very, very important verse. The essence of it and that flow of thought for Paul is that he is constrained, compelled, pressured, driven, motivated by the love of Christ to defend himself, to defend himself, which is really any preacher should do. Any, any pastor, any preacher should do, defend themselves. It is important to him that if Christ loves him so much that he must never be put in a position where he cannot offer back to Christ the full ministry out of gratitude. He will defend his ministry in order that its fullness and its richness may be offered as an act of gratitude back to the one who loved him so much. Now, when it says for the love of Christ, he's not talking about his love for Christ. Let's get that straight right at the beginning. No, he's not talking about that. He's talking about Christ's love for him 
as the context will clearly demonstrate, uh, because he follows up by saying, having concluded this, that one died for all. In other words, it is the love of Christ manifest in the death of Christ that uh, overwhelms Paul. Paul is not overwhelmed with his own love for Christ. He's not saying I'm driven by my own, own, own love for him. No, he's not saying that. Certainly, that is uh, a part of motivation. But he is saying, I am driven I am driven out of my gratitude for his love for me that was so uh, that, that was so uh, enormous. He died. He died. That's the point. Christ's love for him. Christ's love for him. Now, that is a theme of Paul's. He writes about the love of Christ as a member of the occasion. I think back to the 18th verse of Romans in which he says the love of Christ is an unbreakable, unbreakable love. Verse 15, and he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Now, let me just help you to see this tremendous truth that's in this verse. He died for all. That is, he died for all who died in him. Okay, he died for all who died in him. As we saw in verse 14, that they who live now, what does that pre presuppose? That the death was not permanent. It was not permanent. If you died in him, you would also rise in him because he rose. So he says, he died for all that who that all that they who have died in him and now live should no longer live for themselves, but for him, the one who died and rose again on their behalf as their substitute. This takes on immediately back to Romans 6 again, where Paul goes through this uh, with such clarity. Do you not know, verse 3, that all of us who have been immersed into Christ Jesus have been immersed into death. Therefore, we have been buried with him into death. In order, in order that verse 4, as Christ was uh, raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his what? Resurrection. Verse 8 of that same chapter. If we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Verse 10, for the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive in God, to God in Christ Jesus. So you die in him, you rise in him. That is the marvelous miracle of salvation. When Christ died, those uh, for whom he died, those whom he was a substitute died in him and rose in him and now live a new life in him. Okay. And that's clear cut. So when Christ died, those who believe died, not literally, but the old man died, the old you died. And when he got up, the new you got up, the one who believes in Christ, you now a new person, a new man, a new woman. Now a new person is living in Christ and living for Christ. 16 verse, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Now, it is very interesting verse. This, this verse is very interesting. The word, therefore, points to the consequence from the previous. The previous verse about having died, we died in him, Christ then coming alive, we alive in him. We are now not living for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again on our behalf. Therefore, from now on, the point being, since we were in Christ redeemed, since we died and rose again and entered a new life, therefore, from then on, since the time of conver conversion is what he's saying. Since the time when he entered into the substitutionary provision of Jesus Christ, uh, personally by faith, since his salvation, since the moment of his conversion, he has begun to walk in newness of life. And at the very time he began to walk in newness of life, from then on, we recognize no man according to the flesh, or literally we know odia, odia in Greek. We know nobody according to the flesh. Uh, we, 
What does that mean? He says, since con conversion, we no longer evaluate people externally. Got that? By virtue of this new life, he has come, uh, has come a new odia, a new knowledge of God, a new knowledge of Christ. And that new knowledge or that new perspective is a spiritual knowledge, spiritual sight. And he is saying, we no longer see people purely for, from the outside. We don't see them from the outside. We no longer see them purely from the uh, physical perspective. In fact, for believers, all of the valuations, all of our judgments, all of our assessments of people, which were once simply in the light of their physical appearance, their um, uh, typical uh, superficial behavior, their social orientation, um, their personality, that's not how we obey, evaluate them anymore. No more. God sees the inner man once you are in Christ, the inner man, the inner person, the inner being. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. Therefore, in verse 17, so it goes back to verse 15, where Christ died and we died with him. We rose and we rose in him. And the new life causes us never to see anybody else the same. And it also causes us to realize in verse 17, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away and behold, all things are now made new. What is this? This is just the most obvious response, the most obvious conclusion from verse 15. Listen carefully. If death and resurrection of Christ had such a profound change produced such a profound change in Paul's life. Therefore, he concludes, if any man in Christ, he'll have the same kind of profound change. Old things will pass away and new things will come. What, what is he saying? He's saying, I realized all that very beginning, all at the very beginning, that what, he had, what had happened in me could happen in any man who was in Christ. You see that. Uh, that what had happened to me could happen to any man in Christ and would, no matter who she is or he is, no matter how wicked. And God delights in, in taking the chief of sinners, blasphemers, the worst, prostitutes, drunkards, tax collectors, murderers, homosexuals. Here is the wideness of God's mercy that gave Paul his evangelistic commission. I concluded, that if any man is in Christ, he also will be a new creature, just like I was. And that's how he began to view everyone. Either they were or they weren't in Christ. They were not in Christ. Or what Paul had experienced, any man in Christ could experience this new knowledge, this new perception, this new wisdom. Now you had spiritual insight. You didn't live for temporal things. You didn't live for earthly things. You didn't evaluate people on the surface. Verse 18, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So five times in those brief verses, some form of the word reconciliation is used that then defines the theme of these verses. It is all about the ministry of reconciliation. The text and the term itself forms the heart and soul of responsibility, particularly those of us who are preachers. God has called us to preach the message of reconciliation. It is our duty then to tell people they can be reconciled to God. Our mission to bring the message of reconciliation to sinners, to preach to them the gospel, the good news, the uh, the the uh, evangel, the that the relationship, hostility, the relationship of hatred, the relationship of animosity, the relationship of enemy, uh, it, it, uh, the relationship of alienation between God and sinful uh, man can be totally changed so that the enemies can be become forever friends. That is the gospel. That is the good news. It is possible for sinners to be reconciled unto God. And it is our calling to preach that reconciliation. It is then the greatest work. It is the greatest work. It is the greatest calling. It is the, it, it, for it deals with the greatest issue in this world. It is the greatest privilege to be given the responsibility to preach the message of reconciliation. That's what we live for. That's what we die for. That's what we preach for. That's what we serve for. 
That's what we nurture the saints for in order that in the end, the message of reconciliation might effectively reach sinners. 19, verse 19, verse 19. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So literally, he has committed to us means he has placed in us once we've been called to preach, once we've been called to proclaim, we have been given the word of reconciliation. Just a brief note about that. The term word here is again, logos, logos. It, I mean, logos, I'm sorry, logos, I'm sorry, logos. It, it really can be a uh, synonym for message. But it carries even something beyond that. Logos in ancient times indicated not just a word or message, but indicated that what it is true and trustworthy as opposed to what was. On the other hand, mythos, not logos, but mythos, meaning myth, um, mythos described was um, fictitious, what was spurious, what was not verifiable. It's very, the opposite was Logos. Logos. Um, what was true and trustworthy. Um, in the beginning was the Logos, the Word. And the Word was with God. The Logos was with God. So this is the true and trustworthy. Paul uh, was committed to the proclamation of the gospel. Unstingingly, unhesitantly, uh, <clears throat> unreservedly, excuse me. And that is what we are called to do. We announce, we announce that God can be reconciled to doomed sinners, to doomed sinners, the greatest news the world has ever heard. If you look at just the enmity between God and man, it might appear at first hopeless, a perfect, inf infinitely <clears throat> holy, flawless, righteous God whose justice must be satisfied by the punishment of all who have violated his laws. <clears throat> Verse 20, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So we are ambassadors of Christ. Quite an interesting term. And that's presboidman, presboidman, uh, from the verb presboil. <clears throat> it's a very rich term. It's a real, it's related to the term, though it's not the exact term. It's related to the term for elders. But in this case, it is the word for ambassador, ambassador, presboil, and presbutis are connected to presbus, which means old, which of course is connected to presbyterius, which means elders, which are familiar with. We are familiar with elders in the church, elders. It is is a word that means ambassador, but it has the idea of being old because in ancient times, old and experienced men were usually the ones chosen to be ambassadors of emperors, of emperors and of kings. It's a very noble word. It still has a nobility about it when we hear about something being the ambassador to some country. It has the ring of dignity about it. It conveys a great deal that an ambassador represents his government and all of its character and all of its dignity and all of his philosophy. To scorn then an ambassador or mistreat him is to scorn and mistreat the government which he represents. To send him away is to break off relations with the government and ruler whom he represents. An ambassador speaks wholly for his ruler. He is the ruler's mouthpiece. He never utters his own thoughts. He never offers promises, demands his own things, but rather those things of his kingdom. And certainly an ambassador's person and character and virtue lend weight to the authenticity and the dignity of his kingdom. So an ambassador then is a messenger. An ambassador is a representative. His message, uh, his authority are given to him by his king. In Paul's day, and in Paul's day, such a duty was as highly respected as it is today, if not more so. All was achieved at Christ's expense. Why? Because Christ was the only sacrifice who could satisfy God. Christ is the only uh, mediator who could stand between God and man, the testator. God, Christ is the only way apart from him. There is no other way. He is the only one who could reconcile God to man. 
who could break down the animosity. He alone could do it. He alone, he's the greatest, the ultimate sacrifice. There is no salvation in no other, in no other. There is no, there is, there is none other than the name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He alone offered the one perfect sacrifice to satisfy the justice of God. Our last verse, the 21st verse, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteous God in him. Let me say that again. I love that verse. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteous of God in him. So there's the key to everything. Christ had to be made sin. He had to die our death. He had to suffer our punishment. And that's why Jesus on the cross, he said, why have thou forsaken me? God turned his back on him because it was so much sin. Our sins was upon Christ. Our sins, our sins, the sins, the people's sins that were there, the, the sins before uh, those people created that was at the cross, their sins was on Christ. So as Peter says it in 1 Peter 2 and 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might live to righteousness. It was by his wounds we were healed. This is the most powerful truth in scripture. This one verse, and believe me, I'm not through with it. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. The point is it's God's plan. He's the benefactor. God is behind the whole reconciliation plan. He designed it. He worked it out. He brings it to fruition. It is his plan. There could be no reconciliation unless God initiated it. There could be no reconciliation unless God activated it. There could be no reconciliation unless God applied it. He has to design it and he has to execute it. It, can, it, it cannot come from any other source, any other human source. Nothing, made, nothing man could do, nothing man could not could do, produce uh, reconciliation with God. It isn't anything we do or don't do. In fact, all of our efforts in religious realm amount to filthy, rag, filthy rags, the Bible says. So Christ paid it all. He did it. He was the ultimate sacrifice. And so and so we, uh, absent from the body, is present with the Lord. He paid it all. He paid it all. There's no place we go to for purification or nothing like that. We have been purified, those who believe, because we believe in Christ and Jesus paid it all. We don't have to work to get to heaven. We don't have to show works to get to heaven. No, we don't. Our works represents our reward when we get to heaven. However, we don't have to work, okay? Keep that in mind, because Jesus paid it all. And by saying that we have to do some extra works and all this kind of stuff, it's saying that Jesus didn't pay it all. He just paid some. So the word is, is literally filled with religion and all of that religion, apart from Christianity, is man producing a plan with the aid of Satan in which he can initiate reconciliation with God. That is the fatal flaw of all world religions, no matter what name they come under. Romans chapter 3 says, verse 10, there is none that does good. There is none righteous. Not, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. Nobody, absolutely nobody. Now, you would think if there was anyone who could have devised a plan most aptly and pull it off, it would have been the Jews since, after all, the Jews were the people of the true God, the Yahweh, Jehovah. And God gave to them the law and the prophets and the covenants and the adoption and all of the things that Romans 9 mentioned. They had revelation. They had the Old Testament into them. Even salvation was given. Salvation is of the Jews, of them. And to them came the Messiah. Remember when Jesus came, his message, his word was to the Jews. He came for the lost sheep of Israel. It wasn't to the Gentiles, us. It was to the Jews. If anyone could have devised a system by which they could have achieved reconciliation, it would have been the Jews. But they failed. They failed. And in Romans chapter 10, Paul comments, uh, comments on the failure by saying, my heart's desire and prayer for God is for Israel, for their salvation. They have not achieved it. They have not achieved it. So Paul is to us. He's for us. This, this is our doctrine. This is our doctrine, the Pauline doctrine. This is for us. And uh, this is to us and it's for us. And, um, and so Paul is to the Jews first, then to the Gentiles. So he brings the message to the Gentiles. 
And that begins to open it'll open up um, after Acts 7. Everything after Acts 7, it begins to open up to the Gentiles too, not just the Jews only. And so I thank God. I thank God for he paid the total price. He paid the price on Calvary for us. And unlike Buddha, unlike um, um, unlike all the other uh, Muhammad, on and on, all the lowercase g gods, he got up with all power. He got up for our sins. He has reconciled us. He was the testator. He was the one. He was the one. His blood would save us. His, his getting up, rising on the third day would save us because he didn't stay dead. He got up. And I thank God for his resurrection that he sent his own begotten son, only begotten son, to die on the cross and to rise for us. And isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? So now for those who, who don't know Christ and you need to come to Christ, you can come to Christ. If you believe in your heart and speak with your mouth, confess that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that he died on the cross, that he got up for your sins, you will be saved. At that moment, you are saved. You believe that. You truly believe that. And God knows if you're lying, if you know if you're not lying. And so he knows our heart. He searches the heart of man. And so we must uh, come to Christ, those who haven't yet, come to Christ. And because some of you have been going to church for a long time and, and you think you're saved, but you're really not saved. It's your time to come to Christ. It's your time to come to Christ. Um, if you have any doubt or question about are you saved, just confess with your mouth from your heart that Jesus is Lord and Savior, that he died for your sins and that he got up on the third day and he has given his eternal life. And so believe that in your heart. Believe that in your spirit, man. Believe that in your mind. And I'm telling you, you will be saved. The Holy Spirit would come within you. It would come inside of you and it would dwell in you. He would dwell in you. And I thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your support. Thank you for all the messages. I love you so much. And um, join us next time, Friday, for the pastor's moment and on Sunday morning for the word of God. Because we are True Vine, the church of love. God bless. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to this channel and join our online Christian family. Tithes, offerings, and donations can be made via Cash App at dollar sign TVMBC or by mail at True Vine Missionary Baptist Church, 1407 Grove Street, Houston, Texas, 77020. Thank you so much and have a blessed day.